How was your day yesterday? <laughs> Full, right? Yeah. We're going to reflect on the learning from uh, the first day um, uh, before we get into the case session today. But before that, we're going to uh, have a conversation with Jim Anderson, somebody I uh, love and respect uh, and have worked with closely for about seven years now uh, when we uh, started building this program. Uh, Jim is actually a former senior leader in city government in the city of New York. He was the senior director of communication for Mike Bloomberg. And um, when he stopped doing that work, he moved to the Bloomberg Philanthropies Organization, where he founded the government innovation team. And that team has created a enormous portfolio of projects and uh, programs all over the world. Uh, Patty Harris showed you the map yesterday of all the projects. Um, and Jim has been responsible for uh, not only creating those programs and projects, but also really changing the conversation about innovation in city government. Uh, so it's exciting at this point in the program to hear from him, um, you know, what it was like 12 years ago when you started this work. Uh, but then also uh, talk a little bit about what has changed over the years and what excites you. Uh, so uh, I'd like to start taking you in a time machine back to 12 years ago when you started this. Um, what was it like uh, at that time? What did you think of the landscape of government innovation, having been an innovator in government yourself? Uh, good morning. It's so nice to see everybody here today. And uh, Jorah just mentioned the government innovation team at the Bloomberg Foundation, and I would be remiss. I think we have critical mass of Bloomberg Foundation government innovators here, so if you all could just raise your hands. You are awesome. And this is the team that um, has created and runs the What Works Cities program, the Mayor's Challenges, the Innovation Teams programs, the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, and many, many more. Um, so thanks for showing up here this morning. It's nice to see you guys. Um, yeah, so 12, how many of you were in government 12 years ago? All right, so we were with you then. <laughs> um, I think back to the conversation about innovation 12, 15 years ago in the public sector, and there wasn't much of one. The conversation around innovation in the public sector back then was very much focused on sort of innovation as a noun, um, it, solutions and ideas. Um, government's role in innovation was not talked about a lot. Government's role was to provide a safety net, uh, was to deliver basic services, to make sure the roads were clean, the roads were, the infrastructure was in good repair, and to leave the private sector to do the innovating in our community. Um, we set out to really change that. Uh, what we learned from Mike's time in City Hall um, and also from the private sector is that innovation is a process. It's a practice that an organization can get incredibly good at. And we have definitely seen that change over the past 12 years. Actually, it was in 2010, we convened our first sort of mayoral summit at Bloomberg Philanthropies. We had the mayors from probably a dozen large cities. And we sort of went around the room and we asked them, how do you structure innovation? How are you generating new ideas? And guess what the number one answer was? We call McKinsey. So back then, cities were outsourcing innovation to consultancies. And, and so that's what we really set out to change. Today, uh, where's Kate? Um, hi there. Um, Kate from uh, Florida City of 220,000 people was telling me last night that today she's got central innovation capacity within her city hall, as well as an innovation lead in every single agency that is all aligned around the strategic priorities and goals of the city and are all dreaming up big ideas to move the city forward. So I think that really speaks to the shift. Today, we've seen thousands of cities around the globe establish innovation teams, innovation funds, innovation networks. It's really caught on. There's also a lot less experimentation in that innovation. Now, that might sound like a contradiction, but really what we've started to surface are a reliable set of tools and strategies that are evidence-based and that help city governments produce more reliable, consistent, and impactful innovation. Strategies like open innovation, design-based innovation, rapid prototyping, rapid cycle iteration. You're gonna hear more about that from Mitch later today. But there's a suite of tools and techniques that city halls are now using today that they can count on 
to disrupt the status quo thinking, to turn to folks outside City Hall, and to invite more ambitious solutioning um, as part of those innovation efforts. I think that's, that's the change that we've seen over the past 12 years, and it's, it's exciting. I, we're not where we need to be, but the progress is, is obvious and, and pretty significant. Yeah. Well, I remember uh, the first time I met you was before we were working together. I was writing a case with a colleague about the innovation delivery teams in New Orleans and Memphis, and uh, there was such a new phenomenon uh, to, to invest in government capabilities inside City Hall to generate new ideas, to try out new things, and so forth. Um, and I wonder, like 12 years later now, um, what have you learned about the skills, the capabilities, the practices that governments need to do this work repeatedly, reliably, uh, and consistently? I mean, the first, the first piece is, you know, what you'll hear over the course of this week is a real emphasis on three critical capabilities. One is innovation. One is data, one is collaboration. Um, you know, as we've talked with city halls around the globe, those universally are what we hear back as the critical capabilities that mayors and their senior teams know they need to get better at and want to get better at. I think one of the things that we've learned is that you can really build up these muscles within your city halls. It doesn't happen through wishful thinking. It doesn't happen necessarily on the cheap but there is incredible demand within city government to, to grow in these skill sets, and they do stick, and they do make a difference. I think we saw that during COVID, when so many local governments stepped to the front and were able to innovate and adapt their way through that challenge in a way that many uh, folks at other levels of government really struggled to do. They were drawing on the data skills, on the innovation skills, on the collaboration skills, that, that city hall teams had been working to grow and master over time. So number one, building up these capabilities, um, I think should be a focus for all of you coming out of this. We're gonna be talking with you at the end of the week about very concrete ways we're gonna help you on that journey. And hopefully you'll take us up on that uh, in, in, in a major way. Um, but in terms of you know getting big things done, um, there are a few things that I've been seeing many of which also dovetail with the experience I had in Mike Bloomberg's government. Um, so, so one, government as a platform. Um, I think one of the things that's very exciting and very promising and I think is the future is the way that local governments are increasingly thinking of themselves not as the sole providers of solutions on an issue like homelessness, on an issue like climate, but shifting their role to enabler to supporter, to bottleneck remover, to barrier remover. And to think about the ways that government as a platform can summon energy and talent and resources from across the community against a big goal. We want to do something incredible about homelessness. We know that our homeless service funding in and of itself is insufficient to do something marvelous on homelessness. So we need to invite the academics, civil society, our faith communities, our everyday residents in. They have something to offer here. So I'm seeing in cities around the globe a shift from, we gotta come up with the solution, we gotta operationalize the solution within our siloed city government to how do we bring more people together and really push against, uh, push these big boulders up the hill. That I think is, is huge and very promising. And then the last thing I'd say on this is, is, is a lesson I learned from Mike Bloomberg. Mike sort of had a three-part approach. I, I don't know that he would tell you that, but if you sort of observe the history, there was sort of a three-part approach that he took to addressing these big problems. The first was he challenged normality. I think sometimes we've grown too accustomed with the status quo results that we're producing in our communities. And I think about Mike with the failing schools in New York City that he inherited, and he said, this is unacceptable, we can't accept this. He used data, he used moral authority that comes from being in your, in your role, and he used the experience of other cities to say other people are doing better, why can't New York? New York can do better, so challenging normality. Number two, demonstrating the alternative. It's an unfortunate truism that people would rather stick with the poor services that they've got today, then take a leap into an unknown future that they can't imagine, that they can't relate to. 
And I think a very important second step is demonstrating what that future looks like. We didn't close Times Square to vehicular traffic as a first step. First, we took underutilized pockets of asphalt under the Williamsburg Bridge and we converted them overnight into brilliant civic spaces that people could touch and have their morning coffees in. And they said, wow, I can see what it looks like when you take s street space away from cars and repurpose it for civic uses. So demonstrating the future as a path um, towards uh, those bigger grand changes. And then thirdly, um, uh, designing for scale. I think we have, the road is littered with a lot of pilots. Some of them feel like vanity projects. I think we all know that the problems that we face today, uh, we, we, don't, you know, we, we need to pilot things that we expect and hope will work and begin designing for scale from the very beginning, thinking about the resource implications, thinking about innovating business models so that we can get there. That work can't begin once the pilot's proven successful, but that's, an, uh, 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 I think, an opportunity a lot of cities have to do better. So um, you know, those three things we did in the Bloomberg administration, but I see it around the world. Um, mayors with ambitious visions are using the same version of that one, two, three punch. Right. So um, I think what's really admirable is that you really, over all these years, built a field, and a field as in uh, a portfolio of projects and programs, but also uh, a, a network of people doing this work. Um, so there's already kind of a second generation of government innovators that grew up in these units that you know then take jobs in other cities. And it's really interesting to see that also in the literature, there's more teaching cases being written about this. There's more scholarly articles being uh, uh, written about um, government innovation. So it, it's really a, a whole new um, uh, field of study and a field of practice. Now I wonder if you look around the world and you talk to many mayors, um, what have been the most inspiring examples of government innovation? What are the things that you know you feel are really uh, breakthrough innovators, pioneering mayors? Um, can you just share a few examples? I'd be hard pressed to tell you what my all-time favorites are, but I'll tell you four that are um, really exciting to me today. Um, and maybe relate back to some of the other points that I've made. Mexico City. Um, Mexico City, I think, is a city of 11 million people. Uh, their last mayor happened to have been an engineer like Mike um, and, uh, uh, and was very focused on digitizing city government with the idea, I mean, it was sort of this amazing, we talk a lot in the U.S. about digital inclusion and the digital divide. She saw digital as the fastest path to meet the needs of the poorest residents in her city. So really turned that on its head. She did a lot of stuff um, to basically move that city to at scale digitization, including introducing the world's first and largest municipal identification system, the world's largest municipal uh, Wi-Fi network. Um, they actually pay for the time that residents are access are using data to access public services. They subsidize that. They now have 80% of all government transactions are happening online, which is a level of breadth and scope that I think is extraordinary. And really, the, the case there, actually, Steve Goldsmith, who you might hear from at lunch today, has just done a case on their path to digitization that we'll push out to all of you, but, but really exciting to show the way that digital can move out of sort of special projects and sort of service by service digital transformation to something that's whole of government and happens with that sort of speed and scale. Bogota, Colombia, a little bit south of Mexico City, um, I think is showing the future of data and digital innovation today. So um, they have taken, they have a huge informal economy in the city of Bogota, many people working outside of the tax system. These folks unfortunately have to go to loan sharks in order to access lines of credit. I can only, we can all only imagine what the penalties are for failure to pay on time. The interest rates are out outrageous and the mayor wanted to do something about it. So she went to the utility and the telephone companies and she got their data and she constructed from the utility and the telephone company data alternative credit scores for people in the informal economy. They don't pay taxes, but they do pay phone bills and they do have lights in their homes. So we have data on them and, and constructed these alternative profiles. 
that she then went to banks and the banks now accept as a measure of credit worthiness, which is bringing hundreds and thousands of people from the informal uh, community into the formal lending system so that they can access lines of credit. Incredibly exciting. Closer to home, I'm excited about Denver's Love My Air. Um, this is, uh, how many of your cities are doing hyper-local air quality monitoring at this point? It's starting to really spread, which is so exciting. The innovation that Denver brought to that was to use the data as a sense-making tool to educate, inspire, and, 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 and anger residents about the quality of the air. So they posted the air quality data on the front doors of their schools, particularly in the schools, the schools, Title I schools, which are the schools that are in greatest socioeconomic need. And so when parents drop their students off for school every day, they can actually see whether it's green, yellow, or red. This is the place you're leaving your kid for the day. Talk about like getting a parent in the heart. But what that does and what Denver's counting on is that's turning those parents into advocates. It's ground softening with parents for future policy changes to be more aggressive in their work against carbon pollution. And I think that use of um, administrative and performance data that you all are owners of as a tool to educate the public is a really exciting sort of next step in the way that we're using, taking our data practices for sort of public sense making. So that's number three. And then lastly, going to the, that point about government as a platform, I recently met with the mayor of Leuven, Belgium. Um, he's the first Muslim mayor of his city. He has very ambitious 2025, 2035, and 2050 climate targets. And he sort of really embodies this idea of government as a platform. He went out to every single actor within his society, residents, community groups, faith communities, business communities, and he said, these are our goals. How can you contribute? They offered up their contributions. Those contributions were then registered with the city as commitments, and the city is now shepherding all of those commitments, publicly reporting, creating feedback loops, keeping everybody rowing together, and really showing what, wow, <laughs> What does it look like when a city introduces a climate strategy but literally has everybody in the community identified with a role and a, and a goal to play in helping move that city forward? I think it's incredibly exciting and probably the kind of necessary work if we're really going to take those big next ambitious steps in our climate action strategy. So those, those four are, are my favorites today. Yeah. What I love about it is, you know, Many people have a, a particular conception of what innovation is, and very often you hear, oh, that must be technology. Um, and your examples show, like, innovation is any kind of new way of doing things in any area, in any part of your organization. So it's a very broad definition, which uh, allows us to look at inspiring examples from around the world um, with that innovation lens. Um, so uh, finally, what do you hope everybody in this room will take away after this week? What is your vision for that? I'm very excited. You're, you're meeting a lot of my Bloomberg colleagues this week. Um, later today, Steve Goldsmith, who was a deputy mayor. You'll meet Kevin Shiki, who was a deputy mayor today. Um, you, you're, uh, one thing I hope you take away is that this organization is filled with people who walked in your shoes and sat in your seats, and there's just a lot of empathy here for the work that you guys do. Ali Jaffin is sitting up there. Uh, she's our chief operating officer and uh, I think was in City Hall for Mike's first 10 years uh, before coming over to the foundation. So it's really in our DNA to think about you and to think about how this foundation can uniquely um, be a, a, a point of resourcing and support for you and, um, and hopefully create opportunities for you to come together and to like you know, get re-inspired. We know the work is hard, and we know that when you head home, the, the, there's a lot of uh, stuff waiting on your desk. So that's number one. Number two, uh, Leo Neal is going to go through a lot of um, supports and resources that we push out through the Bloomberg Harvard program at the uh, throughout the year. It's so important to know that this week is just the beginning. It's not the end. The difference maker in pulling those resources home is always the senior leaders. The mayor's sort of, but really the senior leaders. 
And so, you know, the second thing I, I think is just like it's, it's a little bit your responsibility when you leave this place to take full advantage of everything that Yorit and Dave and the rest of the team are making available to you guys. So I think that's number two. Um, yeah, and you know, this is really, um, it's special for us to, to get to be with all of you guys. You know, it is a, um, a, an opportunity for us to just treat you like the special people that you are um, when we know that, as, as Patty said yesterday, um, city governments are often under-resourced, understaffed, and under-appreciated. Uh, hopefully, you're, you're getting the sense from us that, that, that in this room, um, the complete opposite is true, and, uh, and we want to send you home with that. Well, thank you for convening us here. Thank you for spending time with us, and thank you for sharing your ideas and, and reflections. Thank you. Good morning. Enjoy the day. Thank you.